mic check, please. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Limit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brazier. My name is John Gordon. I'll be your host. And I'm your host, Katie Burke. Welcome to the Ducks Unlimited Podcast, the only podcast about all things waterfowl. From hunting insights to science-based discussions about ducks, geese, and issues affecting waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America, we bring the resource to you, the DU Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm your host, Mike Brazier, and today we have another Habitat update. We're going to go out west, and we're going to be joined by a a past guest, one that's become one of our favorites. You're going to get to where you'll challenge Scott Stevens for kind of the favorite label, and that's that's not a bad thing. We need to kind of push Scott every now every now and then. Uh, Virginia Getz, our director of conservation programs for California, Nevada, Hawaii, and Arizona. Virginia, welcome back to the podcast. Good morning, Mike, and thanks for having me back. If you're um, you're putting me up against Scott Stevens, that's some pretty heavy competition there. I have every bit of confidence that you're up to the challenge, though. I, I hope so. I will do my best for you. <laughs> well, thank you, and and uh, I'll make sure that Scott hears this so that he knows that we are that he's got to keep his game honed and, and polished. And uh, we have a number of people that we we contact and, and refer to often for these type of updates. It's the time of year where hunters are out there on the landscape, birds are moving, and we like to be a resource of, of current information. And what better place to get that information than the people that are in the field, that are actively hunting, that are talking to the people that are hunting and, and our partners in every federal state agency that are hearing from hunters and being out there on the landscape. And you're, you're one of our go-to people out there out west. And w- you and I spoke earlier about California habitat conditions as affected by the drought. Uh, both breeding habitat conditions is, I think, the majority of what our focus was at that earlier conversation, but we were also starting to look forward to the fall and winter season and what we might expect. And so here we are now. It is November 16th, 2022, and we wanted to check in with you to see how things are progressing. I know there have been a, uh, a there was a notable weather system that came through a couple of weeks ago, and that's probably a useful place to start. Virginia is, is just to kind of give us an update uh, on habitat conditions in California, and if that if that weather system that came through made a noticeable difference. Well, we we did get a good storm coming through, you know, which dropped up to two inches of rain in the valley in some places and really good uh, snowpack, you know, up higher in the Sierra, which won't really help conditions now, but it will help set up a better spring, hopefully, you know, and a better water year next year. But, you know, the, the winter is just a process out here. You know, we've seen in recent years, our weather become more episodic. So we, you know, we had a great start to last winter, you know, an incredibly wet October, and then we didn't really get anything else until a big storm in December. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that what just happened here continues. Um, You know, we continue to get some regular rains and we continue to get some snowfall in the mountains to get us out of this, you know, our third year of really extreme drought. Virginia, I believe it was last year on opening weekend, California received the the atmospheric river that dumped, I don't know, maybe six to eight inches of rainfall in some locations in the Central Valley. And that fundamentally changed the landscape and lifted it from that the drought that we were experiencing at that at that point in time. Now, we all know the rest of the story that it eventually dried up and began to dry again as we got into the December, January, and then certainly in spring and summer. But the rain that was received here recently, that wasn't of the same type magnitude that we saw last year, was it? No, no, not at all. It was a good storm, but it it didn't do what that storm did. And things are so dry. You know, what that really did for us is it put some moisture in the ground. You know, we didn't see water spread all over the valley. Last year, that storm that happened on opening Sunday of duck season basically saved us you know, for the entire winter because it spread water all over the landscape. It was so significant. Um, This recent storm did not do that. We need a lot more for that to happen. But 
I will say, you know, when we compare last year, which were terrible conditions to the conditions we're in now, we're in worse shape this year um, because we have far fewer acres of rice that were planted this year. So even if water comes, the rain comes, and it spreads all over the landscape, there isn't a food resource to the extent there was last year that would then become available to birds. We have a lot of fallow fields, and a good proportion of those fallow fields have been worked. They were worked by farmers, you know, to kind of get them um, prepared for next planting season. So basically they're dirt. There isn't, uh, you know, there isn't a, a seed resource there. Now, if they flood, there could be some invertebrates in the soil that birds could take advantage of. But we're not in nearly as good shape as last year. And last year was not good. And that reduction in planted rice acres that you referred to from this summer, that was drought related. That was a the result of a curtailment of irrigation water for a lot of those farmers and remind me which side of the river of the sacramento valley was was affected worse was it west side of the sacramento river valley that had a tremendously reduced planted rice acres yeah it's really skewed um with the biggest impact being on the west side of the valley meaning the west side of the sacramento river versus the east side of the sacramento river so the west side those areas are getting their water from lake shasta you know, they're getting it from the federal project, Central Valley uh, project on the Shasta watershed on the east side of the valley, on the east side of the river. That's coming off the Feather River watershed, which is a state project. They're in better shape on the east side. You know, so what we saw is I think there's a total of about 1,500 acres of rice altogether planted on the west side of the valley. I mean, it's very, very skewed that way. There's, uh, it's, it's about an 80% reduction over what would be normal on that side of the valley. And then it's, you know, it's about a 15, 20% reduction on the east side of the valley in planted rice. But you end up with, you know, a 50% plus reduction in planted rice. Last year, we had a 25 plus um, percent reduction. So we're twice as bad in terms of planted acres of rice. And what I will say, this is anecdotal, but I've spent a fair enough time in the valley, you know, that I kind of trust what I see. I have seen this year a lot more of those fallow fields in a worked condition than I did last year. So, you know, if you have a fallow field and you get some weeds growing in there, you can get some seed production you know, when the water comes on, uh, like we had the big rain last year. But there's a lot of very, very barren fields, particularly on the west side of the valley. So even if we get, you know, an atmospheric river, you're putting that water ground that is really food deficient. I mean, it may help by spreading birds out and giving them more places to loaf, um, you know, so we don't get heavy concentrations and potential cholera outbreak. But it's it's not going to help us much from a food standpoint. That type of post-harvest soil manipulation is not uncommon uh, in other rice-producing regions. I'm living in Louisiana. I saw it there whenever we had dry falls. Farmers always like to get ahead. They like to be prepared for that yeah. spring preparation uh, for, for planting. And we see it in Mississippi. We see it in Arkansas during years when things are really dry. This is an example of those years in, in Arkansas and Mississippi when it's been really dry over here and we've seen the same thing. And so there's a lot of real parallels in terms of kind of landscape conditions right now. Now, rice acreage in Arkansas and Mississippi wasn't down the, the way we're talking about in, in California, but just post-harvest drying of the landscape perspective, we see a lot of the same things over here. And fortunately, here in this part of the country, we've started to receive some rainfall that has done, just as you described out there, It's begin, it has started to re-wet that soil, to put some moisture in the soil so that hopefully as we get additional precipitation events, we'll start to see it pond. And having driven through Arkansas the past couple of days, we are starting to see that in a few places. Thankfully, it's starting to pond here and there, and you can tell that the fields are starting to get get saturated, but we still need some additional rain to put it uh, put more water across the landscape. And y'all are kind of in the same situation there. Is there any is there any rain, any kind of other storm system on the way? I know the the cold that we're getting in the mid-continent right 
right now is a function of a ridge that's kind of out in the western U.S., and that, I think, has also kind of turned off the faucet for y'all, if I'm not mistaken. What's it looking like in, from the forecast perspective? Well, well, the 10-day forecast is dry. Um, you know, there's been a little blip that pops up next week here and there, and then it goes away, which is never a very good sign. You know, you want to kind of see those things, the prediction all line up for the west side, for the east side, for the Sierra, and then we've got something real to work with. But right now, it's looking dry. It's certainly a lot cooler than it was. We had just ridiculously hot temperatures, you know, in the fall. So we're in a drought condition. Everything's bone dry. It's hot. Um, and it's just making it worse. Well, we've we've cooled down now, and we did get a good rainfall that put some moisture in the soil. But again, you know, as I said, we, we seem to be in sort of this episodic weather pattern in recent years. So if we return to hot and dry for an extended period, we're not going to be in good shape. So we need rain. We need, you know, we need those storms to cycle through. And it's really going to take, you know, for water to start ponding, it's really going to take those classic valley storms, you know, that stack up for two or three days in a row and drop an inch or so of rain a day. That's kind of what we need. And those are the type of storms that also will deliver abundant snow to uh, to some of those yeah. high mountain ranges, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then that sets us up. You know, for next year, won't do, the snow won't do much for us this year. The rain will help in the valley, but it will get us in a much better shape, hopefully, going into next next year, next growing season, and next water year that we can maybe break out of this three year drought cycle. I mean, the the forecast, you know, for what it's worth, is calling for a drier than normal winter. But I think you just wait and see. Yeah. You know, wait and see. We got off to a good start. Let's hope we continue to get some sort of pattern where the storm door is open um, and, and that'll improve. Now, if we get the rains where we are going to get a boost from a waterfowl perspective is the planted acres of rice that are not receiving decomp water that aren't going to be flooded post-harvest. And that's probably going to be about another 100,000 acres out on the landscape that would have a food resource on it, um, you know, in the form of waste grain and certainly invertebrates that are um, growing on that stubble if you just put water on. So that'll give us a pretty good habitat boost if we get the rainfall. Um, otherwise, you know, from the standpoint of waterfowl, the geese are going to be able to take advantage of that dry, the dry fields and the food in there, um, but not so much the ducks. Virginia, on that topic, winter flooded rice is is one of the most critical components of a winter waterfowl habitat landscape there in the Central Valley. I think our colleague, Dr. Mark Petrie, cites uh, about 50% of the waterfowl in the Central Valley rely on, on winter flooded rice for their food resources. Does that sound right? Do I have that statistic correct? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really... Um it's even higher than that in some portions of the valley, you know, because some portions of the valley do not have very many acres of wetland habitat. So their birds are counting on this rice disproportionately, like in the, in the American basin and Sutter basin, you know, kind of the Southern part of the Sacramento Valley. Uh, th those are areas that don't have a lot of natural wetlands. And so the birds are, you know, they're using rice lands. They're getting like 90% percent plus of their nutritional needs off from rice fields. So um, better conditions for wetlands, you know, when you get up in the Butte and the Palooza Basin. But yeah, the rice is so important. I think this is where we're really going to see a hit this year in terms of habitat, you know, and it kind of goes in layers of impact. So one, instead of um, a normal acreage of rice being planted, you know, you cut that acre to about 50 percent, you know, so we planted about 250,000 acres of rice instead of 550,000, so less rice on the landscape. The acres that weren't plant, planted, a lot of those fields will work, so they're in a dirt, in a barren condition, even if you put water on them. Then out of the 250 that were planted, only about 150,000 are going to get winter flooded without help from rainfall, and that is still better than we thought we were going to be. So, I mean, it just adds on where you're seeing the impact. But that rice base is what's really going to hurt us um, from a food availability standpoint this year. And that 150,000 acres of winter flooded rice that, that 
like you said, it's better than what we were expecting, but that yeah. is, that's about half or is about half of what you normally get, or maybe less than half of, of what is normally winter flooded? Yeah, it's less than half of what's normally winter flooded. Okay. Virginia, I think that has given us a pretty good view of, of, well, there's another part of the habitat landscape that we want to check on here in just a second. But I think right now what we'll do is we'll take a break. We'll come back. I'll ask you about kind of how, if this recent rain has, has allowed the state or federal agencies to open up some refuges that were previously closed. I, I think that is the case, but I'll get you to kind of identify a couple of those. And then we'll get your take on sort of the status of the migration and, and hunting success that you've seen out there. So, uh, so stay with us, Virginia. I'll do that. Thanks. everyone, welcome back. We're here with Virginia Getz. She's giving us an update on habitat conditions and status of the migration out in California. Virginia, we wanted to talk a bit about uh, whether that precipitation event from a couple of weeks ago has uh, allowed refuges to sort of reach, reach a threshold of water on their on their properties that they've been able to open hunting. I've heard something about that, but I don't know the specifics. Can you fill us in on, on kind of what we're seeing in terms of new or, or opening hunting opportunities on public lands out there? Yeah, when we, when we opened the season here on October 22nd, you know, the conditions for public wetlands in the San Joaquin Valley were a little bit better than they were in the Sacramento Valley. So both the federal refuges and the state wildlife areas down there were available for public hunting on the opener, but with lower hunter quotas. What we had in the Sacramento Valley is the state wildlife areas opened for opening weekend, but with lower hunter quotas, but the federal refuges did not open. They didn't have enough flooded ground to open. They are set to open for public hunting this weekend on the 19th of November, again, with lower quotas. Um, So it's been, you know, they don't have a full acreage flooded. Um, The Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge Complex, which has Sacramento, Delavan, Calusa, and Sutter, which are all very um, popular public hunting areas, uh, they had 50% of their water allocation, which was way better than the 18% that they thought they were going to start with. Um, had a little help from the water districts and a bunch of other partners trying to figure out creative ways to get more water to the refuge. And they were able to do that and get them up to about 50% of their wetland acres um, flooded. But again, it's not enough to support a full hunter quota. And Sutter Refuge will not open. They have zero water on Sutter Refuge. So it'll be Sac, Calusa, and Delavan that will be available with lower quotas starting this weekend. And what about state areas? Have we seen any changes in hunting opportunities as a result of that, that precipitation? No, not yet. They're, they're still trying to you know catch up and make the best they can with the water they have supplementing with groundwater um, where they can. But you know we're going to need some more storms and we're going to need some of those big significant storms you know i think this this storm we had helped it put some moisture in the soil so maybe if we get another one before too long more of that will run off and they'll be able to use that water to to flood some additional areas but it's going to be kind of a slow grind with um, without weather coming in to help us I've learned just in the short time that I've been kind of doing this podcast, and as I've mentioned before, it forces me to reach out and communicate with people from different parts of the country. No single year is 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 identical. They're all different. They all have their unique uh, challenges and unique kind of favorable setups, sort of depending on where you are this year at least thus far, is characterized by widespread drought across many of our important wintering areas. We're talking about the western U.S., the Great Plains, basically from Nebraska down through Texas, uh, Arkansas, Louisiana, northern Louisiana, Mississippi. Some of those things are starting to change, at least in, in sort of the southeastern U.S., but for the most part, man, we've got a lot of drought across the western U.S. or, you know, Western half, Western two thirds of the of the U.S. I'm curious about how things are shaping up in the Atlantic Flyway. That's another 
uh, another place that we need to touch base with and get an update on them here in the in the near future. So we'll do that. So for our Atlantic Flyway listeners that are out there, just kind of stay tuned. We'll try to connect with some people that can fill us in on conditions there. Uh, but yeah, any additional precipitation that we get is valuable because because in these drought stricken days, it provides addish, additional hunting opportunities for folks. And you know that's not only does drought affect the birds, it affects the the waterfowl hunters. And so um, yeah, we're, it's it's encouraging to hear a few new places are opening, uh, but we definitely need more. I, I did want to ask you, Virginia, about sort of the uh, speaking of hunting and waterfowl hunters. Uh, I know you get out as often as you can. So here, the last part of this conversation, we'll talk about what you're seeing in terms of the uh, what you observed with regard to the migration. We talked a lot about what we were expecting to happen with maybe a um, that given how dry the Salt Lake was, how dry Klamath was, we expected a uh, maybe a faster migration than normal into the Central Valley. Just describe for us the migration as you kind of saw it unfold over the past month or so, and then what, to the best that you can, are you seeing in terms of bird numbers on a relative basis? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of transpired like we thought it would, which is not unlike last year. You know, so what we have going on, on out here in the Pacific Flyway is our fall staging areas, you know, the Southern Oregon, Northeast California area is bone dry. I mean, it is worse, worse than the Central Valley. And so these birds are not stopping um, and hanging around there and staging till they get push down further south they've got to keep coming down here because there isn't a whole lot of the you know the stair steps along the way so we did see um higher probably higher than average or higher than normal numbers of birds like widgeon and green wing teal um that might not be here in those that high numbers early and uh, the refuge the on the federal refuge side i got the same report um, from the Sacramento Refuge Complex, um, they saw the same thing. The other thing that was interesting this year, there was a lot of brown ducks on the opener. Now, there always are. It's very early, you know, on October 22nd. But I would say disproportionate number of brown ducks. Um, you would see green wing flocks on the wing that looked like they were all hens. You know, and until you got them in the hand, you go, oh, yeah, that's a drake. Um, that wasn't colored up. Same thing with pintail. We were loaded up with pintail early on. And a lot of those drakes, you know, no sprig tail yet and white patches on their chocolate heads still. And, you know, I think what, what we had going on probably is we may have had higher nesting in the boreal because of drought conditions on the prairies in Alberta. So those birds nested further north on the boreal, they nest later, they hatch later, and then they ended up coming down perhaps all the way earlier because there wasn't any place to stop along the way. And so then we saw that, you know, down here in the Central Valley. That's a real interesting description, and it makes sense to me. Uh, I had asked Scott Stevens what he was seeing in terms of um, the the molt status, I guess you would say, of the birds that he was harvesting in Prairie Canada whenever the season mm -hmm. opened. The idea being that maybe these birds were nesting later, had a more extended breeding season because of the good wetland conditions in the eastern prairies, which contrasts with Alberta. And I appreciate you pointing that out. The drought in, in Alberta is is would have affected production that would have gone to the Pacific Flyway mostly, but then the eastern prairies, things were really good. And so that same idea of the status of the molt as we get into the hunting season, we think in some years can give us an indication of, of kind of what was happening with, uh, with production this year and the timing of it and so forth. I can tell you from my experiences, a limited experience thus far this year, but also talking with, with other people, is that at least in the central and Mississippi Flyway, there seems to have been Fairly good uh, duck production uh, from from dabbling ducks, ground nesting dabblers. So, so that's a good thing. Um, I, I guess maybe I'll transition to that. Uh, tra use that to transition to hunting in the Central Valley. What opportunities have you had to get out? What are you seeing in terms of concentrations of birds? I'm, I suspect it's shaping up the way we thought it would. If you've got water, you've got birds. But in terms of hunting success, how did you do? How are you hearing from other people? And then any kind of index on production from the uh, from the age ratio in 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 the bag? Yeah, well, 
I think if you if you have water, you've probably done pretty well. I mean, I've I've done well when I've been out. Um, we have water, but we're we're really managing the hunting pressure. We don't have full flooding, so we're hunting one day a week. We're basically instead of hunting three days a week, we're going to one day a week, and I think it's really paying off. You know, we're holding birds, we're not pressuring them. Um, very much until we get more area flooded and the birds have more room to spread out. And so when we've gone, we've done pretty well. And I think that's true for for the fortunate hunters that have a place to hunt and that have water. They're doing pretty well. But I think we have a lot less hunters on the landscape right now simply because there's not very many places to go. So your rice field hunters, most of those guys are out of luck. You know, there is some decomp water that has come on and i think you know the reports i'm getting from the rice is they're doing pretty good particularly during this last week we had a we had a push of birds come in you know with that storm we had a big push of white geese show up in the last couple of weeks and then flocks of ducks you know have come in with this last storm so i think they're the rice field hunters that do have water they're doing pretty good out there right now wetland hunters the same the birds were really concentrated early on and they still are but if you happen to be in areas where there was water you probably did pretty well because the birds couldn't really spread out virginia from a bird concentration standpoint this is sort of a side note or a side question have you or any of our other staff or your hunting partners observed uh, birds that are sick or dead that you you might think when you see that you wonder if it's avian influenza because we're starting to get some reports like that out of the willamette valley in oregon have you seen anything like that in the central valley no we haven't and i think folks suspected there would be more of that but the reports i've heard from the refuges it's not really been a factor and i haven't heard anything um you know anecdotally as far as you know what we'll see Let's see what these birds look like in January because, you know, in a normal year, if you have, you know, you can shoot birds very early in the season and they're pretty skinny. Um, You know, they've just come from migration and they may not be in the greatest shape that way. But birds that hang around the Sac Valley, if they're here, you know, for the winter time, you can shoot birds in January and they are absolute butterballs. You know, they are in really good shape with a good layer of fat. It'll be interesting to see how our harvested birds look in January, you know, with the conditions that they've got on the landscape right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And just kind of sticking with the avian influenza comment, what I'll do is just take this opportunity to encourage hunters that are going afield to equip yourself before you get out in the field with with the contact information for the respective state agency where you'll be hunting. Look up whatever their bird reporting hotline is because I, I suspect as we go through fall and winter, we're going to hear a few more reports like that. I've been in communication, like I said, with folks in uh, up in Oregon about what they're seeing. It's it's a, They're seeing it to a level of, of concern with, with cackling geese mm-hmm. in certain areas. And so that's the best advice that we can provide, provide at this point is equip yourself with that number. When you see the bird, call it in. You know, don't retrieve it. Don't let your dog retrieve it, et cetera. And, and hopefully this doesn't turn into a um, into a, a, an issue for wild bird populations, wild waterfowl. But to, to help also with this, I'll plug our Ducks Unlimited website, uh, ducks.org slash avian flu. We're doing sort of a big communication push to help get the information out there. So check out the website and equip yourself with an understanding of what we're seeing out there. And um, yeah, the the added... The, the addition, the additional kind of layer in here of limited habitat brought about by drought kind of heightens our attention on disease in wildlife populations because that's that's what can can really ramp things up. Uh, and, you know, just from a, a generally disease ecology standpoint, crowded situations are not <laughs> are not good as as we uh, as we can we can surmise. But uh, anyway, just wanted to kind of work that in there. Um, anything else, Virginia, maybe, I don't know if we really covered hunting success that you would have experienced, but I think you mentioned that if you, actually, I guess you did. You, you've had good success. You've, you've done a good job managing the pressure, but anything else that we'd want to want to mention here before we close up? Well, we are working, Ducks Unlimited is, is working on a telemetry study here where we're putting 
transmitters on uh, 60 ducks and 60 geese here, and this is to see how they respond to drought specifically. So get transmitters on these birds and see where they go, how they use the landscape under the conditions that we have right now. So that'll be really interesting um, to see what that tells us, you know, through the course of the winter. Um, we do have uh, two, there's two programs that are um, out there that are providing some relief um, and they're through it's with California Department of Water Resources funding through a grant to the uh, California Rice Commission. And so Ducks Unlimited is cooperating with the Rice Commission on the wetlands incentive program. So basically what this does is it provides wetland owners um, incentive payments to help offset the cost of pumping groundwater to put more wetland habitat on the ground. So because surface water is extremely limited for those wetlands that do have groundwater capability, you know, pumping is very expensive. So it helps offset the cost of that. Last year was the first year of that program. And that program put about 9,000 additional acres of wetlands out on the ground. This year, the second year of the program, we had about double the number of applicants. We had about 100 applicants, wetland owners for the program. Um, and it's going to put water on about 19,500 additional acres of wetland habitat. So that's, that's really going to help us. And then on the rice side, this would be the third year of the rice um, groundwater incentive program, and that program is hugely successful. You know, it's, they're going to put over $2 million towards helping growers put water on harvested rice fields. And I think a total of that is about 40,000 acres. So we're doing a variety of things to try to get water um, spread out and make more food available, more area available to the birds. We do understand there is going to be a little bit more surface water delivery um, that's going to come on the west side of the valley that was not expected. And that could be partially, I don't pretend to understand all the nuances of water politics here, but that storm that you mentioned that we recently had, that may be part of it. What, what was the runoff in the Shasta watershed? And does the Bureau feel better about releasing some additional water for agriculture users and for wetland owners to be able to put on the landscape. So they're going to be able to maintain some of the wetland acres that were flooded on the west side of the valley. Um, and then they're going to be able to flood some additional acres on top of that. So our picture's getting better. It's not good, but it's getting better. Well, that is probably a useful place to stop. We like uh, any kind of high note that we can end on. We'll take it, you know, because it is it continues to be a challenging situation. We will continue to have uh, one eye kind of fixed on the western landscape and see how things continue to unfold in terms of those weather systems here over the remainder of the winter season, the hunting season. And then as we get into spring, uh, we will start looking to, to what that snowpack condition is like and what it may mean for uh, for su summer water, which is uh, which affects breeding habitat conditions for waterfowl locally produced there in California. It affects the ability to plant rice acreage, uh, manage wetlands throughout the Central Valley, and and so forth and so on up and down the uh, all throughout that western landscape. So, Virginia, we will keep an eye on things out there, and we will be back in touch with you probably later on this year. Uh, or, or in the hunting season. And if things develop such that they justify an update, I'll give you a ring and we'll have you back on if that's okay with you. Yeah, I'd be happy to join you. Thanks, thanks again, Mike. Thank you so much for everything that you do for us, Virginia. And thanks for the great reports that you always deliver. All right, we'll talk soon. A special thanks to our guest on today's episode, Virginia Getz, Ducks Unlimited's Director of Conservation Programs out in the Western Region for California, Nevada, Hawaii, and Arizona. We always appreciate her updates from California this time of year. We thank our producer, Chris Isaac, for the great job he does with these episodes and getting them out to you. And to you, the listener, we thank you for your time and we thank you for your support of Ducks Unlimited in wetlands and waterfowl conservation. Thank you for listening to this episode of the DU Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And visit www.ducks.org slash DU Podcast for resources based on today's topics.
as well as access to more episodes. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ducks Unlimited. Until next time, stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the Ducks.